welcome to the very best part of my broadcast. <laughs> this is a great day. It's a great day. I'm in New York. I'm hanging out with a guy named Wayne Fetterman. If you don't know who he is, <laughs> look him up, okay? Look. Now, there are times when there are interviewers like me who will just slobber over a guest and say they do everything everywhere and all of it's great. He does a lot of things. I don't know if they're all great because I haven't seen them all. <laughs> Curb your enthusiasm. Legally Blonde. Yeah. Keep going, Wayne. What else? Well, a lot. I'm going to be in What We Do in the Shadows, okay. Silicon Valley. Got it. Knocked Up. You wrote a history. Step Brothers. Step Brothers. You wrote a history of stand up comedy in the, America. Yeah, from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. But, the, but mostly he's here yeah. to talk about George Carlin, American Dream, two part documentary on HBO. Yes. You are the producer of that, and you won an yeah. Emmy for that. I, there is an Emmy in the house. There is an, an, Emmy an Emmy in the, in the house. house. Yes. And the reason this is such a great day for me is because there is no one more important in my life, not genetically related to me than George Carlin. There I have just no isn't. Idea. There just isn't. Uh, he's my philosopher king. Uh, he's the most important com comedian, I believe, in American history. Uh, when I was a kid, I listened to his records, and then I would do the bits while I was doing yard work in my head. Really? Yeah. George Carlin meant everything to me growing up. Um, and you did a documentary with Judd Apatow. Yeah, he directed it. He directed it. Why is George Carlin in you? I know why he's important to me. Why is he important in the history well, of American someone, comedy? Well, as someone who does stand up, yes. first of all, it's amazing. I didn't know you did yard work, so I'm <laughs> learning a lot about you already. Did you know? Oh, no, no one knows. Okay. <laughs> Second, uh, secondly, well, I'm a not only a stand up, but I'm also a fan of stand up right. comedians, and he is unique in the in the whole history of it in the amount of material he put out, mm -hmm. and especially his evolution as an artist. This sounds serious. It, anyway, and he's funny. It, he's a funny guy. Unbelievably funny yeah. and important in the history of what are the parameters of comedy and what is permissible yes, in comedy. There's yes. an entire body of law built around George Carlin. Right, because he uh, did a famous routine called The Seven Words You Can't Say on Television. And the point of the routine was one, yes, to say these words out loud, but two... <laughs> None of which we can say right well, here. What was two was like, there is no list. No. It's like, so you only know you've said it when you're in trouble. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, just give me, just right. tell me the words. Right. There are 400,000 <laughs> words in the English language, right. and there are seven you can't say on television. Right. Yeah, so he did that routine, and then a ver later version on a later record was played yes. in the afternoon on a radio station. Yes. And... One person who was in the car with listening with his kid complained, mm -hmm. said that, like, I don't think this should be on the air at this, and because I have no choice. Like, I'm just listening to the radio, right. and that all went all the way to the Supreme Court. Yep. And they actually decided that yes, the FCC can restrict broadcast content during certain periods of the time. Indeed. So in a way, Carlin lost that lawsuit. He did. He right. lost the case, but he made the point. The point was made, and again, his big, his lucky, if I, if I may say again, uh, the lucky thing about his life is that he came around when HBO was starting, mm -hmm. and that was a perfect, a perfect platform for his free speech uh, kind of comedy. So it was, and he ended up doing 14 of these HBO specials. And I'm sure you know this. Tell me. Many in my audience don't know this, but the yeah. very first HBO special featuring George Carlin was preceded by a disclaimer. Yeah. Shayna Alexander. I love it. Who Tell was it. then part of the Point Counterpoint on 60 Minutes. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Broadcasting System had a disclaimer saying, we believe this is valuable comedy, but some in this audience, HBO's audience, might find Who this had offensive. paid? Right. Paid for, this Paid for the privilege premium, yes. of, of getting things that are out there that you can't watch on broadcast television, but still, right. there was this sensitivity around it, and it was very serious and very strange. Please be advised, this is going to be content that some might in this audience might find. And then, boom, there goes Carlin. And Can I even say, if you watch that special, yes. which was done at USC, Bovard mm -hmm. Auditorium, mm -hmm. Right before he gets into the seven words, they stop the special and do a crawl an, as if Shayna wasn't enough. <laughs> yes, head <and> study. <laughs> warning, 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 Will Robinson. You were about to hear some words. <laughs> some very you, bad words. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. So, but, but the crazy thing is, those words had been on his albums. Right. Class so clown. People, yeah, exactly. So people knew kind of those Which words. Which won a Grammy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know he won a Yeah, I know. 
Yes. Because I believe when he's yes, on yes, AM yes, FM, yes, yes. he's doing the set. It's in Washington, D.C., and he yes, he's gets handed Oh, you note. are a fan, yeah. Dude, dude I'm a fan. Yes, I'm a huge, yes, huge fan. Yeah. You talked about the volume. I think when How loud he was? No, no. The, oh, okay. the amount of material. Oh, okay, okay. Which does, according to the documentary, blow lots of comedians away. Just the sheer amount of material. Oh, my God. You yeah. do this work for a living. Yeah. Talk to my audience about how that amount stands it's, it's lo- in a different it's, category. It's unprecedented. I mean, maybe since Louis C.K. came along mm. and started writing and producing his own show, but no one had been able to put out that much material on that level. Although, I will say, Bill Cosby did put out a lot of mm-hmm. albums. Yep, yep. But uh, to do an on-camera special, 14 of them, like that became sort of his work rhythm. Mm-hmm. It was like as soon as one was done, he would go out on the road, use half of the material from that and half new, and then within a year and a half or two years, he would have another special. So it's very, extremely difficult. And for those fans, you're a fan, mm-hmm. you can see how he like, okay, how am I going to, like I've already done all the observational stuff about right. reaching in to get a piece of bread deep down <laughs> or, let, you know, jumbo I'm going to get in the plane, not on yeah, the plane. Yeah, all of that stuff. Yeah. And then he got a little more into social criticism. Right. And that really opened up. And I also, two other things are very important. Tell me if you agree with this. One was the invention of the word processor, the computer, because mm-hmm. he that opened up his mind because he's like, oh, now we can cut and paste this, and this goes over here. Really right. opened him up create, creatively. And also was just that he had a epiphany that if he didn't care about the United States, mm-hmm. humanity, the world, this experiment in life mm-hmm. that we're doing right now. Right. This, can we name this restaurant? Juniors. Oh, we're yeah. juniors. We're juniors, yeah. So all of this... If he could stand back and say, I'm not part, I don't want to be part of this. Mm-hmm. I want to have a different view of the world. And so there was some very dark stuff. Yes. I'm sure you know. Oh, yeah. I kind of like it when a lot of people die mm-hmm. is one of his bits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that kind of material, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm a happy guy. I, I enjoy Tornadoes, you know, I pestilence, enjoy the volcanoes. Che- I like the cheese omelets. So <laughs> so when, those are the two. Th- what do you think? Does that sound right oh, to you? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. For absolutely. And. What comes across in the documentary are a couple of really important things. And yeah. we'll deal with the pain of his childhood right. and the difficulties of his adult life, addiction yes. and all that. There are real parts of the George Carlin story. But right. we're going to talk in this segment and into the next segment, his influence yeah. on the comedians that we love and enjoy now. How many of them say it started for them as kids with Carlin? No question. Are we going on yeah, break? Go. No, no, go. Go. we got, got a minute and 20. I have a minute and 20 to and talk. Then we'll, and then we'll bleed over. Jesus. Um, well, obviously. But I will say that he is one of many comedians sure. that are influential. I think what set Carlin apart besides the volume, and I don't mean loudness, of his stuff was just how he really dug down into the English language. Mm-hmm. I mean, he yep. really. And this, what makes it, to me, fascinating, and him is... Uh, the fact he's a ninth grade dropout. There you right? go. Right. And you're also a dropout, right? <laughs> I, I've been dropping out successfully oh, my see, entire oh, career. Yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I've built a modest career out of dropping out. Yes. I love it. I love yes. it. So those, yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to talk. I feel like one minute and 20 is not enough to talk about his uh, thing. Yeah. And so we're going to go to break. Yeah. We're at Juniors. We've been here before. Wayne Fetterman. Yeah, oh, I see the clock. I see the clock now. You see the clock. See? Yeah, yeah. So now it's 20 seconds. So yeah, are, yeah. are you feeling pressure? No, Is there no, a little, I like little it. trickle I, I like running it. out of I've here? worked in television. I know how this works. <laughs> and this is the loosest definition of television. I've yes. Been uh, this is sort of television. <laughs> By the way, way yeah. a big picture of Ebbets Field. Yeah. So they like to show pictures this of things. A, that, this would be a Carlin place, right? Yeah, sort yeah. Of. Well, he, I mean, he's uh, upper, you know, the Upper West Side, obviously. We're going to cut you off there. The time's out, Wayne. Okay, I'm out. talking. There we go. Segment two coming up. It's almost like he created the idea like like comedians or musicians and put out an album.
Welcome back. We love hanging out at Junior's, one of our favorite places in New York. Yes, I know it's on Times Square. I know it's a kind of a touristy place, but I love it. Wayne By the Fetterman way, yeah, I uh, had a little trouble finding this Junior's because there's another yes, Junior's junior. in Times Square. Yes, exactly. That so, I was at, yes. looking for you. Looking for us. But there were no lights. There were no cameras. There was no, yeah. But, yeah, I didn't know how gorilla this you, was going to be. <laughs> All gorilla. All gorilla. All right, now you got you got nine minutes. Yes, let's do it. People that George Carlin inspired, who are com- comedians well, now. It's amazing that and many of them are in the documentary American Dream, HBO Max. Right. I mean, obviously. producer Wayne Fetterman, he put it together. It's. Uh, Can I interrupt you one more time? No. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, obviously, I mean, anyone like Louis. I hate to talk about Louis right. C.K., but he was he gave an amazing speech yep. about it that. Uh, that it was like, oh, this is how you can craft not just a comedy bit, yep. not just get on The Tonight Show and do well, a career. Mm-hmm. This is it. It's almost like he created the idea like like comedians are musicians right. and put out an album yep. and put out a special. Yep. And so when comedians are like, oh, that's really hard to do. Right. Like there's a lot of comedians that maybe have one or two specials in them, and that's incredible mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Yep. So to be able to do 14 of these specials, and obviously Seinfeld talked about seeing Carlin as a kid, mm-hmm. and Car and Seinfeld couldn't. I mean, he's very much like Carlin in that the specificity mm-hmm. of his comedy yep. is incredible. But he's not like Carlin in that he doesn't swear. No. No. In fact, there's some very early recordings of Jerry Seinfeld swearing, like, and it's shocking to hear. <laughs> and he that his, can't be Jerry Seinfeld. His whole point was like, if this bit can't get a laugh without me juicing it, right, with by saying the f word or something, I don't want this bit in my act. Right. Right. Way different than Carlin, but still, the idea of going on the Tonight Show, right, promoting yourself, doing these touring. I mean, he toured like a maniac mm-hmm. from, from even in the, the 60s. Right. He was touring. So, so I we, mean, like. We, and when Carlin started out. Yeah. He did the gin joints, and it was clean comedy. What, and the what joints? Gin joints. Is that what you call them? That's what he called them. <laughs> so they just served gin? <laughs> the best ones do. Yeah, yes. okay. okay. Yes. Okay. yes, yes exactly. The small nightclubs, yes. Right, the right. seedier nightclubs, yeah. And. He would do the Jimmy Dean show. He would do Jack right. Parr. Oh, all no, look at you. Look at you. Yeah. I'm not a, yeah. I am not a dilettante. In yeah. many things, I am. George Carlin, I'm not. Oh, I love it. He fu- and, 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 he, and let he, me and just he, say something real quickly about because he he before we even started doing stand up, he was part of a comedy team, yes. obviously. So then when he started doing stand up, he was playing, as you call them, the gin joints, but these low end nightclubs. Didn't like it. Came here to New York City, mm-hmm. downtown, mm-hmm. and developed. Stuff that he thought could get him on The Tonight Show with Merv Griffin. Right. You saw him on G- the Jimmy Dean Show. And that material that worked for the hipsters mm-hmm. and the folk rock guys down in the village <laughs> right. also worked for on the Jimmy Dean Show. He kills on that yeah. show. Oh, in fact, yeah. we use a clip of that in, the, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. in the documentary. So it was like, oh, he really had an elevated view of, like, this is re- can work anywhere. Right. Anywhere. And, uh, and of course... That is like Seinfeld in mm-hmm. a way. Like I can, I for anywhere. I, I can, can be in Mississippi. This, right. I can be in Massapequa. Right. So it's right. so, so yes. Yeah, so he those early routines when he would get on television are really great pieces of comedy. And you and you say in the documentary yeah. he yeah. evolved four or five times. Yes. Oh yeah. We really kind of only do three, but if you really break it down, there's many more little. That is so hard to do in the creative space. Oh my God. Yeah. In the creative space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. It's, look, most people, most comedians have a persona. Mm-hmm. Most rock stars have a persona. Right. And they sell it. Right. And and they'll do the greatest hits 30 years later. Well, I mean, this is the amazing thing. It was you as a comedy fan is, like, people want the greatest hits mm-hmm. in everything but stand-up. Yeah. What do you... Because the basis of stand-up is surprise. Mm-hmm. The basis of comedy is like, oh, I didn't see that coming. What a great idea. This is incredible. So, And then, although every once in a while he would do uh, a routine called baseball versus yeah, football. football. Oh, yeah. 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 An all-time classic. Yeah. So that was like a clean that he would, he would pull out every once in a while. Sure. But he was... Uh, 
always writing, always creating. Talk to me about the yes. perception later in his career that he was angry, George. Oh yeah, too angry. It's and not I, a, it's I, and not I don't a perception. Feel it. I don't feel it. But you don't feel it at all. No, no, I when do. When he says but, but, like but, f kids, like yeah. that's one of his bits. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, this feels, this feels like, this feels good to me. <laughs> The perception, though, yeah. or the, the, the knock on it was he was either too angry or angry because he had run out of material. And I didn't feel that way. I felt that there was something well, I think he passionate was, about it. You don't and, feel like he was disappointed? Oh, sure. Yes. He seemed extremely disappointed in, I hate to say it, I think he was disappointed in capitalism. Mm -hmm. Like, he really was like, okay, it seems to be working for some people, not for everyone. Like, this is the best way as mm -hmm. human beings we can create our society, which is kind of ironic considering he always had new cars yes. and had a private jet <laughs> at one point. So, yes, he enjoyed the luxuries. He, he yeah. did enjoy that. So. But he did disdain them in a certain he way. He did. I think he had a real disdain. I mean, obviously, if you mm. know the routines, yep. like about businessmen and right. stuff. But I think he didn't like hypocrisy was his main and he's one of the at, few, at the end few at the comedians end. Yeah, yeah maybe this is more true after he died yeah in which the right and the left embrace him oh, or yeah. pull parts of him for themselves in yes. this very no divided question. culture we have no where question. there's our humor right and it's different than your humor yeah george carlin crosses over no question and again it's easy to kind of like uh, cherry pick mm -hmm. different parts to like oh he's uh, he hates political correctness right. or he hates environmentalists or feminists <laughs> and then it's or the hypocritical same. feminists or hypo hypocritical and, environmentalists and, and, yeah any of that stuff so he uh, and then on the other side obviously I mean he's been railing against like kind of big business and mm -hmm. businessmen for a long time although did do uh, commercials yes exactly he did do commercials exactly yeah, so he just said I I you know I just love his mind and he said something that fascinated me because everyone's like oh he's just trying to convert people to whatever this mm -hmm. liberal cause or whatever he but he said that's not what i'm doing at all in fact he hates when comedians do that mm -hmm. he really dislikes it his thing is like i don't want people to change their mind i want people to think oh George Carlin's thinking. Right. He's thinking in a new way. Right. He's looking at the, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, he has a famous routine where he really dissembles religion. Yep. In a ve I mean, it is brutal. One of the leading causes of death. <laughs> I mean, and for somehow, terrible with money. <laughs> Always needs money. <laughs> Always needs money. <laughs> all and real powerful, estate. All and knowing, real estate, all yes. The, knows it. So, I mean, it is just point after point after mm -hmm. point in a comedic, wonderful way. Right. So... And if you uh, go back to something like Class Clown, it's a very small bit. It's not yes. the least bit vulgar yeah, about yeah. Muhammad Ali. Yeah. What was the hypocrisy of Muhammad Ali? Right. You know, well, if you won't kill him, we won't let you beat him up. Right, ha, right, ha, ha. Right. right. You know, they basically, well, what did the government say to Muhammad Ali? Well, you can't be a fighter anymore unless you go to Vietnam and kill people. Him. You know, and he just turned the whole thing upside down, exposing the hypocrisy, totally right. clean and brilliant. Bri always. That, I mean, that is... That's almost said that the definition of what Carlin did was his laser focus on the reality as opposed to the sheen of, he would call it the BS of it all. Mm -hmm. So it was just thrilling to listen to him create this material. But can I just go back yeah. real quickly? I do think he was angry. He came off as an angry guy mm -hmm. at the end. And... And a lot of times, not exactly get off my lawn, but kind of close. You know? Yeah, yeah, it was a little of that, and maybe that was part of it of, of being, you know, in his late sixties. Mm -hmm. And, but he always tried. I think tried to get laughs. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, there was runs where he would do where he was pontificating, but he was always like at his heart, he was like, oh. I'm a comic. I got to do this. Got to do it. You're right. We're at Juniors. Wayne Fetterman is our special guest. The topic is George Carlin. Yeah. The documentary, George Carlin, American Dream. Lots of other things Wayne Fetterman does. Look him up. You see him everywhere. Things you didn't know he does. But he the does. only thing I won an Emmy for is that, that thing. Is yeah. That, that. And speaking from, well, sort of personal, kind of tangential experience, Emmys are kind of cool. Anyway, I'm Major Garrett. Segment three coming up in just a second. But you can see Carlin is already kind of like, what's going on in this world? Like, there's no, yeah. no stability here at all. My dad is so much to be feared.
Welcome back to Juniors. Wayne Fetterman is our special guest. The topic, George Carlin, uh, my philosopher god, if there is such a thing. He is. So he really is there is. anything you disagree with, what, as someone who's listened to a lot of it? Is there anything where you're like, you know, I, I'm not totally on board with this? So look, there was a period of time where he yeah. did, a, did a thing about rape, and yeah, rape. Which, which was, I mean, like, whoa. And I, even then, as someone who was just devoted and an evangelist for George, I'm like, <laughs> Whoa, okay. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot back a little bit. Uh, yeah. This is a little heavy for me. And, but, and there, there, was, there, was, there was a comedic angle there, right, but I'm right. telling you, that is, like, that is terrain that I just don't know anyone would even investigate. And not only did he investigate, he put it out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he said... The death stuff, I was totally into. You were? Yes. Like, cross the person <laughs> off when they die out of your book and all of that <laughs> I, because I just thought, like all comedy, you know this. Right. It's right next to pain. Yeah. yeah. It's right next to pain. Not all of it. Not but a lot of it is. Not all. And of you got to understand that pain. You got to understand that fear to right. get to that place that's surprising, and that pulls something out of you that you mm. didn't even know existed, mm -hmm. and that you can find a comedic angle to. And I think that's one of the things that George Carlin hands off to anyone who wants to be in that space. Well, it's interesting your reaction of stepping back, yep. because he said that. He felt like it was the comedian's obligation, and this is where I think Seinfeld is different, and certainly other comedians of finding what the line is, mm -hmm. what the, your line is, yep. and then deliberately mm -hmm. going over the line. Yep, deliberately. So that's what he did with he you. Did. No and, doubt. Then, and then he said, and sometimes he would say that and go, and hopefully make the people happy that mm -hmm. I did. And a lot of times they're not happy. Nope. A lot of times they're like, how dare they're you? Walking out. Yeah. They're walking out of his shows in Las Vegas. They're uh, they're yelling at him. They're you know obviously what happened to him in uh, in uh, Wisconsin at the mm. Playboy. Yep. So uh, so anyway, so he felt like there was a provocative part to his stand up, and then later in his life, he said that he became more of a writer who performed his writing mm -hmm. as opposed to a comic who's just trying to get laughs. Exactly. Like he felt like he was like that was his main focus that was his mission statement and I did we did it was, it's not in the documentary but we did interview the producers of his his HBO specials mm -hmm. and they said that he was word perfect even in the rehearsals like it was memorized almost like he was like a play right. like a Shakespearean play or something right. like word for word everything and most comedians aren't that quite that. Right. But, uh, so tell my audience yes. who Patrick Carlin is. I'm not familiar. So are you talking about his brother? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. I don't remember that guy. No, he had an older brother. Who <laughs> <laughs> okay. Had, he, there's two kids in this family. Yeah. And he, they had an abusive father. Alcoholic father. An alcoholic, abusive father, who was supposedly this incredible... Uh, after dinner speech. Like Toastmaster, yeah. Yes, he could really spin a tail. And so he used to beat up Patrick Carlin quite a bit in these drunken things. And one of the reasons that family left, they escaped from their dad. Literally down a fire escape. You know the whole story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then hung out in the Catskill Mountains for a couple of years until they finally got, came back to New York. And... I mean, a deeply fearful, traumatic experience. This Very was... traumatic. But so already you can see Carlin is already kind of like, what's going on in this world? Mm -hmm. Like there's no, yeah. no stability here at all. My dad is someone to be feared. Again. George Pat was incredibly young at the time. Very young, but still. Patrick, five years older. Patrick hated the father mm -hmm. with a passion. Mm -hmm. So. George, I think in a way, was like kind of like, oh, he's my dad. He's this mm. funny guy. The dad, and this I think is very important to George Carlin's uh, development and journey, dies of a massive heart attack very early on. I think mm. in his 40s. So there's this sort of sword mm. hanging over George Carlin. Like maybe I have a bad ticker mm -hmm. as well. Weird he would do that amount of cocaine. <laughs> Right? Which he was open about. He was open about. He was open, but I'm just he saying. He cracked jokes about it, yeah. Yeah, of course. He did for the whole time. But I'm just saying, for the amount of, like, knowing that he has a bad ticker or that that could be a part of his family tradition. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Uh, so, anyway, I do feel like that gave him a certain, like, oh, I might be, my days might be numbered. Right. 
So I think that gave him a certain latitude to maybe push where other comedians are like, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. Mm -hmm. Like, look, I'm on the clock. I'm, yeah. I might be on the clock here. Right. So I think that was uh, part of, what do you think? That's a theory of mine. For sure. Yeah. And, and look, uh, I think there are a lot of ways in which any child of an abusive family yeah. sprockets off in lots of different directions. Uh -huh. And it comes in waves. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you internalize that and externalize it different times in different ways. Right, 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 right. But I think there's a through line. It, it would be, hey, how much, how much longer am I here? But right. most doctors would not write down genetic predisposition to cardiovascular illnesses, <laughs> snort a lot of cocaine, and drink wine all the time. <laughs> right. They would not write that down. They, they would that. not hand that on a chit to George Carlin. Course, but that course. was his lifestyle. That, a, a, of course. Drank a ton of wine. And he's been smoking pot since he was a teenager, maybe right. to 14 or 15. It's, ama or it's amazing he lived as long as he did. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah, he did kind of abuse that body quite a bit. Quite a Tell bit. Tell me about Kelly. Well, Kelly is George Carlin's daughter, mm -hmm. and they had uh, one one. Luckily, George met his wife on the road in Dayton, Ohio, and he found a champion. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so they were like a team, and yep. they had this one kid, yep. and they would travel around in mm -hmm. a Dodge Dodge Dart, and. That was like the three musketeers, the three right. of them. They had a very, I mean, obviously. In those early specials, he referred to her. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's interesting. I've seen Tonight Shows, and I'd be curious what you think about this, where he kind of make, makes up a family in like, you know the way like Dangerfield would right. talk about his doctor, <laughs> Vinny Bubas or something like that? He makes up like he has like a stupid kid and does jokes about his stupid kid, like a son. Right. That I'm sure Kelly was home like, I uh, exist. Uh, right. I'm an actual person. <laughs> so it was interesting, mm -hmm. you know, that he, but I felt like in most of his stand up, he didn't talk about no. being a dad no. or anything like that. No. It was all. But she's sort of the keeper of the Carlin flame, is she not? Oh, no question. I mean, she, I mean, she had to live through all of that. Mm -hmm. So she had, and the fact that she allowed us to do this documentary with her permission was to me a key part of the whole thing. Was we, that hard to get, the permission? Well, no, it wasn't hard to get because she wanted to do it, and she had written a brutal book. Yes, yeah. Growing up at the Carlins or mm -hmm. something like that. That's just so honest, and she's on her own journey because mm -hmm. she had some uh, drug and alcohol yep. uh, abuse problems, and then she like figuring out and like coming to terms with this in a way absent father mm -hmm. who was on the road all the time creating a new hbo special for right. your enjoyment <laughs> right. right are you happy now yeah, exactly leaving her behind yeah, yeah it's, she's it's, in the wake over mm -hmm. there drowning with no no attention and you're laughing at home i hope you're happy it is part of the unfairness of life yes yeah 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 so uh so he kind of created and did she want it to be honest the documentary yes yeah yeah she was she really she was incredible she was incredible and she still is, uh, she is incredible. So, but she had done a play, this is the thing is, she had done a play to kind of, as her own therapy, mm -hmm. to kind of deal with, okay, what did I, what was this tornado right. that I, I what mean, was this mom was I an lived. alcoholic, right. she ends up dying, or dead. so the whole, she just did a play to like, kind of like, I need to figure this out, mm -hmm. and wrote this book. And then in the wake of that, she had, she had like put that all aside and like, what if we do a documentary? And she was like, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And Judd had done a documentary on Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling, exactly. I don't know, yeah. And so she loved that. Mm -hmm. And Gary, believe it or not, one of the reasons he got into comedy was because he went to see George Carlin, right. wrote some jokes for him, drove all the way back to the show. George Carlin had read all the jokes and said, I think there's something here. Right. And that made him move from Arizona to Los Angeles, cut to the Larry Sanders show. Boom. Yeah. So That's how it works. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Carlin definitely, I mean. When in doubt, kids, write your jokes down, <laughs> hand them off to a famous comedian, something good might happen. Something good might happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Wayne Fetterman. We are a junior. So we're just going to have coffee and water. We might eat later, but that's for us <laughs> to decide and you to never figure out. Segment four of the takeout coming up in just a second. He was famous for as soon as the show was over, he was in the car. Yeah, out. Like Elvis has left the building. Like <laughs> he set records. <laughs> Welcome.
Welcome back to Juniors. Welcome back to our conversation about George Carlin. So, to show you what a Carlin nerd I am, yes. the first concert I attended in my life was not a music concert. I was born in 1962. This is the 70s. I should be going to music concerts and music festivals. What do I do? I go to Peterson Gym on the campus of San Diego State University to see George Carlin, my first concert. What year is this? Probably 75, 76, 77. Oh, so you yeah. saw peak mid. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mid. Yeah, that's the, that's the second. Yeah, that's uh, the sort of second true tr run through the collegiate world, you know. Yeah, but that's the second version of yes. him where yeah. he wasn't we're playing nightclubs. Nope. He was just playing the colleges, the coffee yep. houses, and then small theaters. And he was doing the stuff off those albums. Yeah. FM and, and we AM. sat on the floor. You did? Yes. He was on a little stage in the middle of, the, of this gym. Who opened for him? I'm very curious. I don't even remember. Okay. It made no difference to me. All I was there was for Sounds like was you fun. were high. It's fine. <laughs> it's, uh, that will not be discussed in this program. <laughs> so, the, so I'm very curious about that concert. Mm -hmm. Like, do you remember how long he did? Do you remember? It was about he, an hour and a half. Do you re wow. That's, that, already, that's a long time for yeah, a comedian was, to yeah. do. And do you remember? And did you any bits that he had done on record that you recognized? Yes. So well, he, obviously, this seven words you can't say until yeah, he, he did, did that. He did time. He did, oh, I remember love that. It. Remember uh, this, folks. Yeah. You don't tell time. Time tells you. <laughs> soon, soon. Look it up. I love it. I love it. I love oh yeah. It. yeah. All those things. So this is the hippie. This is the hippie. Yeah. This the, is the long yes, hair. Yes. This is the hippie. Blue jeans. Right. All that stuff. Right. He's not wearing a suit anymore. No. Not playing no, no, Vegas, no. 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 Any no. Any of this stuff. And this is really, in a weird way, not in a weird way, it's like peak early George Carlin. Yes. Like he became, this is when he had the private plane mm -hmm. and he was able to tour. And, and it was it was post-Vietnam, so he didn't do as much Vietnam stuff, but the whole thing, uh, America the Beautiful, the song, yes, yeah, the, the rewrite the, of that, right. all that was Did he do the hair there. poem? Hmm? Did he yeah, do oh, he did the hair poem, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Because I, I never saw him during this period. So yeah, it was really envious. great. It was so great. So was envious so great. of you. Do you have the ticket? Do you know how much it I cost? don't have the I was. I'm not a collector like that. I wish I was. Okay, okay. Uh, but my girlfriend at the time was like, what are we doing? We're like, we're going to see Jordan. Went, Why? I'm like, Shh, you'll, you'll figure it out. She was I very happy. It. Oh, yeah. She was very oh, happy. She's like, I love it, wow, I, love I didn't know you. Wow, you're kind of cool. You're kind of hip. Like, well, <laughs> stick around. We'll see what happens. Hey, I live in San Diego. <laughs> Why was Judd interested in this project? Well, I think one because Kelly was involved. Okay. I don't think Judd would have done it without Kelly's involvement. Is George him. an influence for Judd? I think Gary was more because he great. had a very close relationship with Gary. Judd is a comedy nerd. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but when he was in high school, he pretended just exactly like this. Not, not, but pretended to be part of a radio station, and he interviewed all these comedians. He just, and he has these tapes. It's when he was still in high school in Long right. Island. So he's always been a nerd about it. And Carlin was one of these giants mm -hmm. that you know no one had been able to really crack on. Like, all right, what was the story of this guy? And and he also, I think because Judd is sort of political a little mm -hmm. bit, Yep, is that I think he was really fascinated and wanted to expose and find out, like, most comedy is, it's like milk, it goes bad. It's mm -hmm. very ethereal. So, but George Carlin's bits, whenever something comes up, suddenly they're on TikTok right. or yep. Instagram yep. or thing, like they get, or YouTube, that these clips get passed around. It's like, you know, he died a while ago. Yep. So it's really interesting that like anyone who was who would probably have never even heard of this guy mm -hmm. would pass around. It's like why is this guy evergreen in some areas where you don't see people passing around with all due respect, Lenny Bruce clips. No. When the abortion gets overturned or no. something like that, or no. when there's a, a shooting. Nope. But you will see George Carlin clips. Right. So I think that aspect of him, that Carlin was smart enough to know like. Let me not do, I mean, he did do the, the Ali's things, but the, most of his stuff is about bigger issues, right. especially towards the end. Right. What, that's my theory. What do you think? No doubt, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that comes across in the documentary American yeah. Dream yeah. is that after, after his passing, yeah. which was a brutal day for me, I remember June it. June 22nd, 2008. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what? I, he's, no more? No more? He lives on. And yeah. social media has created this other space 
of attachment, appreciation, celebration of George Carlin that he wouldn't have, I think, really been able to fully anticipate. Kelly probably doesn't fully anticipate. Right. But it goes on and on and on. Oh, yeah. No, it's... And again, I think it's a testament to his ability to craft high levels mm -hmm. stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. And again, some of it is just like, oh, I agree with his position right. on the, this is abortion and they, right. they seem like they're anti-women and so I'm just going to play this. Right. But I think some of it is like, oh, wow, this is, this is like a comic philosopher as opposed to just, oh, I'm going to do a funny bit right. like I do about uh, Crunchwrap Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And if it's you watch classic. the HBO, yeah. HBO specials, you know there are times when Carlin comes out and there's no, hi, how are you? The oh, yeah. first joke out of the, oh, yeah. out of his mouth is a howitzer. Yeah, oh, no question, no question, no question. <laughs> Which yeah. is also, I think, startling to people in the biz. Like, what? seriously? No, hey, how is oh, this? Let's no, get no, it working no, out. No. Let's, let's all get settled in. No. Wham. And no, that, that crowd that, work they, wasn't his no, thing. No, that came with a confidence that I think most comedi comedians have mad respect for. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if I would use the word arrogance, but there is uh, a level of just like, I'm here for me, you're here for, for me. me. Exactly, it's part of his bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Be, let's be clear about this. <laughs> let's be clear what's going on here. <laughs> I'm not here. So, and I think he did, but I do think he really, especially at the end, and he talked about it, was because he seems like this cynical guy who doesn't mm. care, or anything, but that like when people would come up to him and say, "I saw you at uh, this college," or mm. "I saw you at Westbury," and I'm bringing my kids or something. Right. Like I think he really enjoyed that. Like, oh, this is cool. We've been on this journey all together, of all of us together, as much of as, as. But he would leave. You know, he was famous for as soon as the show was over, he was in the car. Yeah, out. like Elvis has left the building. Like. <laughs> He set records of, like, the cars run. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm gone. I did it. God. I'm not hanging around. There'll be no autograph sessions. But it, the crazy thing is, like, this is all, it's all about, we talk about, like, these social issues mm -hmm. and how we still, but in, a, in another sense, I always think of him as, like, show business. Show business. Like, he loved Danny Kaye. Yep. He loved yes. these. Inspired old, by Danny Kaye. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And the verbal acuity that Danny Kay did mm -hmm. when he did those patter songs written by his wife and stuff. Spike like, Jones. Yeah, he would like, he was able to do that even till the end. Yeah. Even to, I don't know if you're from, well, obviously you are, but there's something, there's this poem, I don't, not poem, but spoken word thing called A Modern Man. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh yeah, look it up. Look up Modern Man. And the fact that he could, I could never even You will memorize. save yourself after watching it. Thank you, Major, for letting me know about right. Modern Man. Oh. You were seriously. I'm no, playing, don't thank Wayne. There. Don't thank Wayne. But you, can, you can look that no, one. No, no, I got it. I like doing over the shoulder. Um, so, I got to stop you there. Yeah. Segment four is nearly over. I love it. We have the takeout outtake especially. Yeah, well, that's segment five coming up in just one second. <laughs> our thanks to Juniors as always. Our thanks to Wayne Fetterman. We'll see you for the takeout outtake especial on this microphone right here. He was just using comedy as a way to get on television. Right. The producers would see him. And the next thing you know, he would be like a Jack Lemmon kind of character. <laughs> Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. We're at Junior's. Wayne Fetterman is our guest. The topic, George Carlin, my opinion, for what it's worth, the greatest <laughs> American comedian ever. Right. The most influential, my philosopher god. Uh, he was also an actor. He did cool movies. Yeah. I remember seeing the movie Car Wash. The only reason I watched Car Wash because I knew Carlin was in it. Small role, not really important, but I'm like waiting. Wait, wait right. where, where's Carlin? Where's right. Carlin? But he always he tended to do like that New York guy. Yeah. Like whenever he, he did a bit about a New York cop and keep it going, shows over and all of that. Like he tended to do that voice. Come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Well, yeah, Move along, yeah, Johnny. Yeah, Move along, Johnny. Quite even, a bit. Even if it's your mother. What's, what's great about that movie is also Richard Pryor's in that movie. Yeah. So it's this weird convergence and Franklin Ajay. Who's, and uh, Kevin Smith is in the documentary, American yes, Dream, yeah, and yeah. two great movies. Carlin's in. Right. Dogma is the best. Yes, yes. Dogma yes. is fantastic. And Kevin said, Carlin was a serious actor. I mean, he, he wanted took, to. He took, is, took his acting seriously. He wanted, well, this was the crazy thing. He thought, and this is in the documentary that I found fascinating, like, he didn't even want to really be a comedian. 
he was just using comedy as a way to get on television. Right. The producers would see him, and the next thing you know, he would be like a Jack Lemmon kind of character actor right. or right. something like that. And he gets booked on That Girl, mm -hmm. and he plays like, I don't know, an agent or something, and he's, he doesn't like it. And he feels like he's not in control the mm -hmm. way he is on the nightclub stage. Right. And it's really shocking and a big setback for him that he doesn't, that this part of his dream is I was like, oh, well, maybe I should just continue with the comedy. Right. Insane. Right. Insane. But even in his later years, he was still taking acting classes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We had an interview with, uh, it never made it to the documentary. Yeah. That he was still really, really took it seriously. And I think was frustrated because... The whole thing about stand-up is you're in control. Mm -hmm. You're in control. The whole thing about acting is you're sort of like, you know the lines, but you have to let it all go mm -hmm. and just be in this scene with that person. Right. And it's, you're out of control. And I don't think he, li he liked it. And he was good in all, everything he did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny. He did that kid show for years. Yep. But, <clears throat> yeah. It's interesting. The, the Tank Engine. Yes. Yeah, he did the yeah. voiceover for that, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the name of that show? It was called Tom Thomas the Top. Thomas shiny, the shiny Times. Right, Tank Thomas the Tank Engine. Yeah, yes. yeah. I think yeah. Ringo had done it, and then he right. took over. So there was very a good voiceover on that. Yeah. So there's a lot of kids who just know him from that. I mean, it's <laughs> like you have no idea how much he hates. So kids. tell me this. Uh, yeah. There are times when you watch the specials yes. when he will go over to a stool, and it looks like he's looking at notes. Is uh -huh. he? Sometimes, I mean, in, are because, you his, because his bits were so long and his the specials would go an hour or more. Right. Are you talking about his HBO specials? Yes. That's a good question. I, I haven't noticed him looking at, at notes during that. It, again, it looks like he is. Like, uh, and, and I mean, I, I know in the, the Carnegie Hall one, he mm -hmm. definitely is. Because okay. that one, he is trying to figure it out. And an uh, incredible concert. And that he was so disappointed. He was crying after the concert. Because? Because he thought it didn't go well. But you it know, did. <laughs> Again, the, the difference. But if you watch it, I can see why he was upset mm -hmm. because he stumbles over some things. And again, back to the Danny K. He was right. always like syllable perfect, mm -hmm. not word perfect, syllable, syllable perfect. Yeah. And so when he, so I saw him stumble over a few things. So he's like, oh well, if I had another shot to do this, right, I could do a better job. So he was really disappointed, and it was so well received, and that really launched, to tell you the truth, his his HBO deal. Did he make HBO in a certain way? <clears throat> well, he was part of... The, no, I think... Okay. I mean, look, those first, the first concert you're talking about, right. the one from USC, right. not many people had HBO no. at that time. And he said doing that special was fun, but not nowhere near mm -hmm. as important as doing a set on The Tonight Show right. or doing a Merv Griffin right. show. Right. Because it wasn't even, if I'm not mistaken, I don't even think it was in L.A. Mm -hmm. at that time. Like, HBO was a very, very early. regional, yes. Long Island, I believe, San Diego. So We were early adopters in yeah, San Diego, yeah, yeah. way ahead of the curve. Incredible. For the only time of our lives. And then so, but then later in the 80s, it became a big, and it became a, uh, like a linchpin mm -hmm. for that entire network for their live programming. But they did so much comedy programming. And he was just part of it. And if you ask me, I feel like it was more like between the Larry Sanders show yes, and the sure. Sopranos. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think in those early days of HBO, he gave it a kind of heft. Yeah. They got the best comedians. Yeah. 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 The, in the world would do it. That was the pinnacle before Netflix to do an HBO special. And he was one like, oh, and not only do I get to do one, I get to do one every two years. Right, right. So for my audience who may not know, what's the best George Carlin album in your opinion? Uh, to me, I, don't, I am an FM and mm -hmm. AM and Class Clown. Yeah. Those two albums oh, yeah. are to me, the uh, again, it might be the age that I am. Yes, for sure. But I felt like that's if when- If you're gonna dip your toe in the water, yeah. download those two albums. That would be my, yeah. Yeah, and, and see you if will you like not this. regret it, yeah. And then he, uh, and it's interesting because a comedian created the record label that allowed him to do this material where he was allowed to use mm -hmm. language that wasn't acceptable. Right. And that was Flip Wilson created this uh, record label called Little David. Little David, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So it was like another comedian 
like going like, oh, this guy has to be heard. Mm -hmm. And he had done an album for RCA called Take Offs and Put On, right. where he doesn't swear at all. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, if you want to hear the authentic what's going on in the nightclub, get one of these Little David albums, FMAM, mm -hmm. obviously Class Clown, Occupation Fool. Right. There's a number of them where he's like, oh, this is what it's, this is what I'm doing. And it elevated him so much bigger than mm -hmm. Just playing the normal, right. I'm going to be a clean comedian, I'm doing clean material. So on behalf of Wayne Fetterman from Juniors, we say thank you, Flip Wilson. Yes. And God rest your soul, George Carlin. That's it. See you next week.